So first of all, welcome to today's webinar. Um, this is the second workshop in our series of introducing critical realism for social science research. Um, today uh, we have Ismail Alamudi with us. Great to have you here, Ismail. Ismail is a professor in the School of Management in Grenoble um, in France, and uh, he's going to be talking to us about epistemology. Um, there's a few practical things on the screen. I guess most of you will understand them already as you were here uh, for the uh, webinar a few weeks ago. Um, so I guess the key thing is that we will be using the Q&A tool to manage uh, questions when it comes to, to that stage of the proceedings. Um, so please put your questions onto the Q&A tool. You should have a Q&A button on your screen, which will open up the tool. Um, and you should be able to upvote other people's questions if you're particularly keen for those ones to answer. Um, when it comes to the Q&A, we will then give you the opportunity to uh, ask your questions uh, using the microphone. Um, at the moment, your microphones are disabled, but I will go through and enable them all as Ismail is speaking. Um, I think that's all I need to say to you at the moment, um, except to say if you do have any um, practical issues, technical issues, um, then please use the chat screen uh, for that um, to send the messages to the host or hosting panelists. Okay, with that, then I will hand over and stop sharing my screen and I will hand over to Ismail, who is uh, our presenter for today. Yes, hello. Well, thank you very much, Dave, and thank you to all the organizers for organizing this meeting. And also thank you very much for, to each one of you who, uh, who is taking the time and patience uh, of sitting behind your screen uh, for today's seminar. Uh, which will be on epistemological relativism uh, in the context of critical realism. Um, I really hope that you will make something good uh, out of today's session, uh, as I will be arguing in a minute um, uh, really what makes, what makes really the value of these sessions um, in contrast with, say, a book uh, or in contrast with YouTube videos uh, is their interactivity. So please, when I will be presenting, do not hesitate to, in your mind, try to think in terms of, okay, what Ismail is saying, do I agree with it or not? Uh, does it contradict or does it enter in tension with other things uh, that I may have read uh, on the same topic? Um, and uh, then we will have ample time uh, to discuss uh, both any questions you may have about what I will have said, uh, but also equally, perhaps more importantly, uh, to discuss also uh, in relation with your own research project. Um, I gather that in this group, most people, the vast majority of us uh, do have a research interest of some kind. Uh, this may be because you're, you are a PhD student preparing your thesis, or you might be already an established academic with an interest in critical realism, uh, but I'm thinking it that you will have your own research interests. You are on your own research journey. And the idea really is to bring you some perhaps hopefully useful building blocks uh, that you will be at freedom to evaluate and perhaps use, perhaps amend under some form or adapt to your own research project. Yeah, so the more you can get from my talk, not only in, up in the abstract about critical realism, but in connection with your own research interests, with your own research topic, with your own research project. And I believe uh, the most you make uh, out of this talk, because when we think about it, I will never be as clear and subtle and precise as a book, and perhaps not as entertaining as so many YouTube videos. However, what I hope I can bring today, it is this interactivity um, with a researcher who has spent about 20 years of his life, perhaps a bit more, uh, studying uh, critical realism. So without further ado, now I would like to share my screen because I have prepared a few slides. And so if I push on this button, and then there is a share button. Can you all see my screen here? Could at least one person perhaps uh, yeah. just let me know that, yes? You, yeah. you, you, you can see the screen very well, very well. 
So I'm just adjusting a few icons on my screen to make the whole presentation smoother. Uh, here we go. So basically, as you can see, I thought, well, if I had to explain epistemological relativism to my own daughter, who is eight years old, uh, what would I say? What would I show? Uh, usually, I like starting really thinking, okay, if I had to explain this topic to an eight years old, how would I address it? And I thought that actually uh, our colleague, uh, Johnny Go, uh, has found a picture, which is a perfect introductory metaphor for epistemological relativism. So here, as you can see on this picture, we have a cylinder. So in three dimensions, when it is a three a cylinder, however, there is a blue wall on the left and there is a, a green wall on the right. And on the blue wall on the left, we can see the shadow of this cylinder and the shadow is a square. Yeah, if the light comes from the right into the uh, blue wall on the left, then what you will get will be a square which also means that if you are sitting as an observer exactly where the source of the light is, what you will see will not be a cylinder, it will not be certainly not a circle, but it will be a square from where you are standing. And you will have very good reasons for believing that well, what you're seeing has the shape of a square. And conversely, if you are sitting on the left side of the picture, say where the source of the light that goes onto the green wall stands. Yeah? So on the green wall, you can see a circle. Why? Because the light that comes from the left into the right green wall actually touches the cylinder in such a way uh, that the shadow is that of a circle, but which also means that if one, if any of us were to stand where the light is, uh, what we would see would be a circle, yeah? So we have a cylinder, and yet one person is really entitled to say, well, what I see is a square, and they've got very good reasons for this. The other person is perfectly entitled to say, well, what I see is a circle, and they've got also very good reasons for this. And it takes really an entirely different perspective to see a cylinder. However, even from Still another perspective, say someone who would not be interested in the light, light waves, but say, for example, in uh, infra, infra waves, uh, which uh, inform us about the heat, uh, then we might see altogether very different forms. Yeah, so here what we can see is that the knowledge we have about the object actually is relative to the position we are occupying. Well, this is epistemological relativism at its most basic. And this is what we will be talking about uh, today. So the structure really of the webinar is that in the first part, which has already started, uh, I will be defining what do we mean by epistemological relativism. I will also be asking how is epistemological relativism articulated within critical realism? Because there are many ways of theorizing epistemological relativism. Personally, I find that the critical realist approach to epistemological relativism is particularly, I find it uh, intellectually rigorous and uh, fruitful in terms of inspiration and in terms of orienting research. But this is, you will be able to judge better on this hopefully after this seminar. And then I also wanted to reflect a little bit further in terms of asking, okay, what is the significance of epistemological relativism for the social sciences? So today I'm making the assumption that the vast majority of us are perhaps not professional philosophers, but that we are doing projects in the social sciences. Now, obviously I'm open and interested. I'm always interested in discussing epistemological relativism with philosophers, but today I'm assuming that the audience is more an audience of social scientists. And then hopefully we will leave enough time. I will try to leave enough time for a part two, which will be much more interactive. And part two ideally should not be centered around critical realism as much as it should be centered around your research project, or at least it should be centered on both, on the connection between how critical realism can help enrich, uh, um, perhaps challenge uh, your research project that, uh, that you hold dear. Um, and so in particular, I would like to invite you to start thinking as I am presenting, start thinking in connection with your own research project. 
how is what I'm saying, how does it influence the way you will design the empirical studies you may wish to conduct? Uh, what I will be talking about, how does it influence, how does it bear on how you theorize those constructs that you bring in your studies? Um, also, uh, in terms of engaging in academic debate, uh, I will suggest that the, the, taking epistemological relativism seriously also imposes on us a certain ethics when discussing research in academic debate. Um, so we will say a bit more about this, uh, but I invite you already to open your mind uh, and your interest to creating links between what I am saying on one hand and your own empirical research projects, especially when it comes to designing the study, to theorizing constructs, and then to trying to convince our colleagues, your colleagues, uh, that uh, your approach is at least as good as alternatives and in many ways fresh. Um, any questions so far? Anyone experiencing difficulties, either technical um, or conceptual, something I had said which was not sufficiently clear? No. Okay, so yeah, so I will assume Oh, I can see that in the chat. No, I can see that in the chat, people are saying good morning and hi and wow, just impressive. We've got people from Finland. We've got someone from Nigeria. That's really nice. Tokyo, Leeds, Dublin, and the Daniel who is in Switzerland. I go to Switzerland uh, quite often as well. I don't live very far from there. Okay, so let's continue with and get into the depths of epistemological relativism. Before getting into the depths, I would start with a surface. So basically a dictionary definition. So epistemological relativism is an expression composed of two words. There is epistemological and there is relativism. Epistemological is the adjective that's relative to epistemology. Yeah, so anything that has to do with epistemology would be epistemological. But what does epistemology mean? Well, epistemology is the study of how we gather knowledge. It's the study of how we produce knowledge or the theory, if you like, of how we produce knowledge. And there can be various approaches. Some people will say, actually, knowledge has to be mathematical. If it's not mathematical knowledge, then it doesn't count as real knowledge. You can call it perhaps knowledge, but it will not be scientific and it will not be as good. Okay, that's one approach to knowledge, that's one epistemology, a highly mathematized epistemology. But there are others. Another approach to epistemology can be about saying, well, we need the scientific method. Oh, but what do you mean by scientific method? Well, we need experiments and labs and protocols uh, uh, that ensure replicability. Well, fine, that's, there is an epistemology behind this. That is basically the epistemology is the assumption that this is the form of knowledge that counts as good uh, knowledge. But there are others. You can have interpretivist epistemologies that will say, well, actually, uh, knowledge, especially when it comes to human communities, we have to understand their sense making. Yeah, so basically epistemology is, it is the theory of how do we gather knowledge? Do we get knowledge just by observation? Do we get knowledge from the world by interacting with it? Yeah, all these are epistemological questions. But epistemological relativism means something a bit more specific. Epistemological relativism means being a relativist about epistemology. Ah, but what does it mean to be a relativist then? I'm starting to understand epistemology. It's the theory of how we get good knowledge. Uh, but what do you mean by relativism? Well, if you open a dictionary, you will find uh, the Oxford English Dictionary. They say, well, relativism is a doctrine proposing that truth or morality is relative to situation and not absolute or universal. So in other words, something might be true in a certain context and perhaps false in a different context or perhaps true from a certain perspective and false from a different perspective or moral from a certain perspective and immoral from another perspective. So here, let's note a few things at this stage. The first that this definition clubs together truth and morality. Uh, yet, if you think a little bit about it, there is no necessity to this. Uh, one could be a relativist about morals and 
uh, and a non-relativist about truth. Um, I have argued that that was the case for uh, Blaise Pascal, uh, the French philosopher, for example, um, uh, another person, and, and vice versa. You, you might be a, a relativist about uh, truth, uh, uh, sorry, a, a relativist about morality and not about truth, which I have argued uh, was the case for Max Weber, for instance. Um, and then, um, so this is the first comment. The second comment I'd like to make is that, well, here they express relativism uh, regarding situation. Yeah, the Oxford English Dictionary, it says that relativism is about saying that something is relative to the situation, that truth is relative to the situation, or that morality is relative to the situation. But what about the subject of knowledge? Is it the situation that is relevant, or is it perhaps the subject of knowledge? Let's leave a question mark there. Um, but let's take an example just to see, okay, like to really get to grasp uh, with, uh, to get to grasp with uh, this uh, notion of epistemological relativism. So if we say Sally works more than Harry, so this could look like quite a straightforward sentence. It's quite clear. In most contexts, we understand what this means. And in most contexts, we may not necessarily need uh, much more information to get the gist of what this means and even to be able to appreciate whether it is true or false. But hey, a relativist actually would uh, ask a few very important yet slightly nagging questions. Uh, the relativist would say, well, how do you measure the amount of work? If you say that Sally works more than Harry, are you counting work in terms of hours? Are you counting work in terms of results? Uh, but even these results, uh, is it the value of the work, but for whom? Uh, is it the value of the work for Sally? Is it the value of the work for the market? Uh, is it the value of the work for the owner of uh, the company where Sally works? Um, and also when you measure the amount of work, do you want to take into account the pain involved, the efforts involved? Yeah, so actually measuring even a sentence as simple as works more actually is open, it's potentially open to contestation. And in order to understand it, it is, we have to understand the context within which it is being said. Um, and uh, and it is open to um, not only to ambiguity, uh, but it, it, its meaning will depend on the perspective that you are taking. Yeah, this takes us back to the very first picture that we were uh, that they have presented. Perhaps from a certain perspective, Sally works more than Harry because. Um, well, let's take for example a very simple example. It depends what. Do you count as work? Do you count house chores as work? I mean, this has been a classic question for gender studies and for Marxist Italian, uh, Italian Marxist autonomists. The discovery that what we counted as work actually was extremely limited because perhaps in the workplace, Harry works slightly longer. Maybe Harry works seven hours a day when Sally only works six hours a day. But then if at home, Sally does an extra couple of hours when Harry only does 30 minutes, of extra work, then if you count house chores, then actually you would say that, well, uh, Sally does work more than Harry. If you do not count house chores, then it is the reverse. See how this depends on the perspective you're taking. It depends on uh, how your perspective on what you mean by work. And then why is it significant? Also, the value of knowledge depends on the correctness of the knowledge, but it also depends on its relevance. And yet, whether this knowledge is relevant or not will very much depend on whether you are interested in combating patriarchy or whether you believe that this is not an interesting topic. If you are interested in combating patriarchy, then it is extremely interesting to say, well, actually, society only counts six hours of work for Sally because these are her salary due hours. However, uh, however, if we also count house chores, then actually she works eight hours a day. And this is significant. It shows that women play a much more important role in the product, in the economic reproduction, and in the for the capitalist system, they play a much more important role than what is accounted for by uh, by, by by basically accounting systems in corporations and even by states. Yeah, see how actually if here I'm trying to show that it matters that epistemological relativism actually, it's not only an intellectual, it's not only interesting intellectually, 
but very practically it bears effect on how you will do your research, how you will acknowledge that there are different ways of doing research. And then in terms of policies, it helps understanding why, how you get different policies depending on different perspectives taken from by the researcher. Okay, now I'd like to get even a little bit deeper and go into a technical uh, definition of epistemological relativism. One of my favorite definitions uh, is provided by Tony Lawson uh, because it's commendably clear. And basically Tony says um, that epistemological relativism expresses the idea that our categories, frameworks of thinking, modes of analysis, ways of seeing things, habits of thought, dispositions of every kind, motivating concerns, interests, values, and so forth, so basically, the ways in which we view the world, the ways in which we make sense of the world, and the ways in which we are motivated to make sense of the world, all of these are affected, are affected by your life paths and sociocultural situations. Yeah? So they're not only affected by the truth to which they are referring, but they're also affected by the subject of knowledge, by our own life path and by your own sociocultural situation. And so these, these sociocultural situations, these life paths, therefore, make a difference in how we can do, in how we can see uh, things and in how we can know things and in how we can approach things. And they also seek on which we seek to know, on our motivation for knowledge, on our will to knowledge. So a few remarks. The first, that Tony is very careful. He never ever says that contextual conditions determine. He always says that contextual conditions affect, but do not necessarily determine entirely how we produce knowledge. So that's the first point, it's really important. The second point is that epistemological relativism entails much more than fallibilism. Unfortunately, in critical realism, so most critical realist authors, actually, all, I would say, perhaps by definition, every critical realist author will acknowledge epistemological uh, relativism. However, what people put behind the expression epistemological relativism can vary. Sometimes it is very light. Sometimes it consists only in saying that it is about epistemological fallibilism. Now, fallibilism is part and an extremely important part of relativism, but I would like to argue that there is much more to relativism than fallibilism. So fallibilism is about saying, well, I could be wrong. And at any point, there is, I cannot exclude the possibility that I might be wrong. So the value of, the, of my theories is just that they are more plausible. They are perhaps even more correct. They are I would even go as far as to say that I have good reasons to believe that they are more true than alternative theories. However, a fallibilist would never say, I am uh, absolutely sure, I have absolute certainty that my theories are true. Yeah, so this is epistemological fallibilism. Now I'm saying, yes, keep your fallibilism if you're interested in, uh, I, I, I think that this is quite a strong stance to be fallibilist. However, I believe that there is also more to epistemological relativism. In particular, epistemological relativism also includes the ways of accounting for things. Yeah? So it's not only about saying I might be wrong about X, with X being my object of study, but it's also about saying, well, there are various ways of explaining X. There are various ways of describing X. And it might not, it, might, it is not necessarily the case that one way of describing X is better. Well, we will see in a minute that it is possible to agree on standards for a rational evaluation of theories. However, um, even when we undergo this rational evaluation of theories, a, an epistemological relativist will also accept the fact that when you have two theories, more often than not, each of the theories can see things that the other theory cannot. And uh, finally, uh, epistemological relativism also gets us to reflect on our, uh, on our own interests. Why are, am I interested in X in the first place? Well, perhaps the answer is that I have grown up in a patriarchal and macho society and then that they have tried to move away from that. Yeah, so as a result, I might be interested in why Sally, whether Sally works more or less than Harry. 
Um, these could be very personal reasons. One could say, well, they are unscientific, perhaps, but yet they might influence the way I will gather that data, they might influence the way I will orient my reading around the topic, it might orient the way I will interpret the reading, the way I will interpret what people tell me as a social scientist. And I believe that for these reasons, it is scientifically extremely relevant to reflect on my own viewpoints, because this is part of uh, the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the truth value of the truth claims that I am making as a social scientist. So basically, if I had to theorize or to schematize what I'm trying to say, I would say that within critical realism, epistemological relativism holds a very interesting place. Or perhaps even better, I would like to say here that there are many ways of thinking epistemological relativism. And the way of thinking it from a critical realist perspective is particularly interesting. Why so? Because look at this triangle. So here I have put, if you like, the three main pillars, the three uh, basic ideas, and so the three central ideas of critical realism. The idea of ontological realism, the idea that well, the subject of knowledge does not create entirely her object of knowledge, the idea that there is a real world out there, which I'm not creating entirely as I theorize about it. Then there is epistemological relativism, so which we have just defined, which consists in saying, well, knowledge is an artificial product produced by people within, and it is produced in specific conditions uh, that do matter. Now, what I find interesting in critical realism is that you see this idea of epistemological relativism. It is, if you like, limited in a very interesting way. It is limited by ontological realism on one hand, and it is limited by judgmental rationality on the other which means that a critical realist cannot say everything goes, uh, all forms of knowledge are equivalent, all forms of knowledge are equal. Or, I, or, and a realist will not be, a critical realist will probably not be able to say anything counts as knowledge, poetry counts as knowledge, uh, a gossip counts as knowledge in the same way uh, as uh, a, uh, a verse or a poem would count as knowledge. A critical realist would say, well, hey, 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 yes, we are epistemological relativists, but we are also ontological realists, which means that, yes, the knowledge that we are producing is artificial. Yes, if you take a book, let's take one of my favorite books, Morphogenesis and Human Flourishing, edited by Margaret Archer. So basically, the content of this book is artificial. I mean, this book has been produced by people and machines, even inside the concepts, the words that you can see, actually all these concepts are, uh, have been produced by people. Yes, yeah, so it's artificial. But however, these concepts and these ideas, they refer, they refer to what we call in critical realism, intransitive objects of knowledge. They refer to objects of knowledge which are not entirely created by the book. Yeah, so this is a book that talks about human flourishing. Now, it is not because the book has started talking about human flourishing that human flourishing has started. Human flourishing is that about which the book is talking. In other words, human flourishing exists independently of the book being written or not. So we have to be an epistemological relativist while at the same time accepting that we are not creating the concepts that we use in our theories, that these concepts that we're using in our theories are references. They refer to these concepts, which are the reference. However, so this is a very interesting limitation of epistemological relativism, which allows us to use it uh, in a very focused way. Another very important limitation of epistemological relativism that is brought by critical realist thinking is putting epistemological relativism in tension with judgmental rationality. What is judgmental rationality about? Well, it is about saying that while it is possible to reach agreement within a human community on which theories are better than others. So basically, if you are an epistemological relativist, and a judgmental rationalist, what you will say is, well, actually, the theories in this book are artificial constructs. However, there are different books on the same topic, and some of these other books on the same topic propose different theories. 
sometimes these different theories might contradict the theories in this book. However, what judgmental rationality tells us is that it is possible, at least in principle, to agree with the authors of the other books on, okay, on which, according to which standards is your theory better than mine, and according to which standards is my theory better than yours. If we are interested in explanation, then according to which standards, so it, does your theory explain better than mine, or is my theory better at explaining than yours? And what is it that each of the theories explains better than the other? Yeah, and usually this is how the discussion ends. We end up understanding that well, theory A explains this, this, and that better. Theory B explains that and that perhaps better. And however, there, is, or there are also points of contradiction between the two theories, and it might be that theory A is right, or it might be usually that it's theory C, which is a, subl a sublation of theories A and B, and that subsumes it, subsumes them, and which is perhaps closer to the truth than either theory A or theory B. But basically here, the key point is that this process of discussion can be uh, rationalized. It is possible to have a rational discussion about uh, comparing theories, while at the same time being an epistemological relativist. Yes, as you can see, there is quite a neat uh, uh, space uh, for uh, philosophical reflection and social scientific endeavor. Okay, and now we're addressing the very final part of my talk today. Um, before we open the discussion. So this is really about the significance. I would like to talk a bit about the significance of epistemological relativism uh, for evaluating research. And also I will talk about the significance of epistemological relativism for engaging in academic debate and for conducting research. So the significance of it all. Let's start with evaluating research. Evaluating research can be whenever you are examining a PhD thesis and you ask yourself, okay, well, is it good or is it bad research? But it can be much more often when you are examining your own works. You know, you are actually trying to write the paper and you ask yourself, well, is this something I can say rigorously? Uh, is, this, uh, is this argument, does it hold water uh, or not? Uh, this empirical study that I have made, is it rigorous um, or not? And here, what epistemological relativism tells us is that what makes good knowledge is actually multidimensional. What makes good knowledge, actually, it depends certainly on the state of affairs that is being described. So this is the ontological realism of it, of, of critical realism. Uh, because we are realists, our knowledge does not have value independently of how well it refers to the object, to the scientific object, to the object of study. However, there is more to that because only saying that would be about, would amount uh, to having a very, uh, what sometimes people call perhaps a bit derogatorily, uh, 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 a naive realist stance. It would be about saying, well, okay, there is a real world out there and I'm just writing about it. But there is a bit more, especially judgmental rationality tells us, well, there are also rational procedures of justification within a community. And these rational procedures of justification within a community are part and parcel of what makes good knowledge. Good knowledge, it will also depend on the rational procedures of justification within a community. Uh, let me take an example. Uh, today in management schools, uh, there is a lot of open-mindedness uh, about um, studies on a sample of one and that are conducted ethnographically. This has not always been the case. Uh, 20, or 20 years ago, it was much more difficult. It was still possible, but it was more difficult 20 years ago in the context of management uh, academia uh, to conduct ethnographic studies. People would say, no, but these are not scientific. Your sample is too small. You're working with a sample of one and you are only working with 20 informants. And uh, what they say is subjective and what you make out of what they say is also subjective. Uh, so this cannot count as good research. Well, yes. However, what judgmental rationality also tells us is that, well, but we can actually 
We can engage, and it has been a long discussion, consisting in saying that ideographic research, so the research based on a sample of one, still tells us things about the world. And sometimes it tells us things about the world that one would not get by just running a questionnaire among 300 qu people uh, with pre-designed and preset questions. So actually, judgmental rationality is about saying um, that um, uh, actually we can agree on a procedure for saying, well, this form of knowledge has value. For example, if uh, knowledge of understanding humiliation at work um, uh, through interviews, this can have value. We can agree rationally on that. And so good knowledge depends on the procedures. Depending on the procedures at play, you will say, oh, this is good knowledge or this is bad knowledge. And also it depends on the knowing subject and on her community of knowledge. It also depends, as uh, we were saying, uh, our courses in life determine, or not determine, they influence at the same time what we can see about the world and also what interests us about the world. So what makes good knowledge depends not only on the objects, but on or the subjects, on the procedures of justification and on the state of affairs as that is being described. But also the value of knowledge is multidimensional. Now, this is an idea that I was inspired to me by reading realism, but also by rereading Kuhn after having read realism. So Thomas Kuhn is that uh, classic uh, philosopher of science in the 20th uh, century. And he is the one who came up with the idea of paradigms and scientific revolutions. And it's really interesting to read, especially the postscript uh, to the structure of scientific revolutions, because there he says, actually, he has been taxed of being an epistemological relativist, and he is. However, he says, well, but that his epistemological relativism is not also refutative. Ah, uh, that's interesting. How come? Uh, and then he says, well, actually, the reason is because uh, there are many dimensions that make the value of knowledge. And so, for example, knowledge can have a value because it, is, uh, because it offers good descriptions, or it can have value because it offers good predictions, or it can have value because it offers good explanations, or it can have value because it is practical for the emancipatory struggles of certain oppressed groups, or it can be valuable because it is instrumentally useful, for example, helping a company making more profits. So there are various dimensions that make the value of knowledge, says Kuhn. And if we do not agree on these dimensions, then yes, we can enter a very murky debate, very little rationality there. However, Kuhn says, once we have agreed, once we have agreed on the values according to which uh, we are measuring the worth of knowledge, then it becomes possible to have a rational debate. Now, for me, it was super interesting to see Kuhn, who is really presented as the archetype of the uh, relativist in, in the philosophy of science, it was really interesting to, to hear him defending a form of rationality that is really quite close to the form of judgmental rationality that is defended uh, by Bhaskar. I always wondered whether Kuhn had had the chance of reading uh, Bhaskar uh, between writing RTS and writing this postscript, but this is a different question. My point here is that the value of knowledge is multidimensional. We cannot say, oh, this knowledge is better than that one without saying according to which value. Is it, or is it better in terms of describing or is it better in terms of predicting? Or is it better in terms of explaining or of emancipatory power or instrumental usefulness? Now, luckily, in most cases, these go well together. In most cases, a, it is possible to get at descriptions that will and that theories that will beat other theories on all dimensions. When this happens, hooray, you know, like there, is, there are no, no particular difficulties. However, it's not always the case. And it can be very useful in order to understand uh, uh, academic disagreements to understand that very often these academic disagreements are ultimately based on different values in terms of what makes good research. And to understand this, is or about already having an epistemologically relativist approach or stance. So that was about evaluating research. Now I'd like to say a few words about conducting research. What's, what is the significance of epistemological relativism for conducting research? 
I would say the first thing, the first significance is as Rutsu, Tim Rutsu reminds us in his blog, that it challenges the divide between the theorist and everyone else. Because if you think about it, philosophy of critical realism, it's not about how scientists gather knowledge. It is about how human beings gather knowledge, which also means that all the considerations that we have just had about how social scientists gather knowledge. Yeah, we've said that it is fallible, it is perspectival, it uh, happens within a community. Well, this happens actually, if you think about it, with every John Doe uh, you know, with every person you know, every human being who is capable of speech and of uh, social interaction, every human being who is capable of knowledge, actually is also dealing in their own way, has to deal in their own way with the complications of epistemological relativism. Yeah, so as social scientists, well, we occupy a certain standpoint, uh, but so do participants. In front of the cylinder of social life, perhaps participants, most participants see the round, and as social scientists, perhaps we see the square. However, we don't yet see the cylinder. It's just that we see the square, and we see that they see the round, and perhaps by confronting this square with their round, we might get at something akin to a cylinder or a proto-cylinder, something that might look a little bit like a cylinder. So the social scientist occupies a particular standpoint, but so do participants. And the social scientist can have a different perspective from participants. But this different perspective, it's not because there is something magical called science and that I do science and they don't. I would say we have to be much more humble about that. The reason why we have a different perspective is because we have different obligations in everyday life. And, uh, and in, a, in many senses, in a, an important sense, the scientist has many privileges, especially in terms of time and money, but especially in terms of time. They don't have to worry too much about bills, so that was the money bit. And in terms of time, they have the time to read and they have the time to think. And then, so that's one privilege that explains the privileged perspective of the social scientist. I believe far better than saying there is something magical called science and we have it and you don't. But also the, the social scientist has a certain authority, a, a certain legitimacy, if you like, to navigate through various settings. So you go and talk with the managers and they see squares. Then you talk with the frontline workers and they see lozenges. Uh, then you talk with the accountants uh, and they see rectangles and you try to make sense of the various shapes that the people are seeing about one and the same social reality. So I would say that if there is any form of academic privilege, it is best thought under these, uh, under these conditions. It is a privilege that really comes from the material conditions of possibility of making, of working as a scientist. And also, which also means that scientists, especially social scientists, must always remain extremely humble in terms of how people can be competent. I mean, I would say, for example, I've been interviewing financial traders. In many respects, I believe I can see things about their activity that they miss, but I would be totally unable of doing their job for a full day. I just, I don't have the competence. It's their world, it's not my world. I have been looking at how they create that world, or better, how they reproduce that world. But uh, I'm not capable of acting as competently as they do. And especially when it comes to daily practices, but it can also be sometimes uh, that your our informants can be well read. Uh, so we have to accept that well, participants are much more can be more competent than the social scientists. Also, it means that. If we take epistemological relativism seriously, then we have to grant it due to local knowledge. I would encourage you to read this author who is not a critical realist, uh, Scott, but who wrote a splendid book titled Seeing Like a State, how certain schemes to improve the human condition have failed. And so basically local knowledge matters. If you're an epistemological relativist, you will not be able, you will not want to dismiss local knowledge on the basis that it's not scientific. And also it means that we should, we can, and we should perhaps attend to knowledge production as a social process and as a political process. So in my own research, in my own empirical research, um, with a co-author, I looked at how a company 
makes people invisible and how a company makes people almost unreal in the sense that uh, that was a company that would mistreat workers and that would beat them up and that would make them use dangerous products that would pay them less than the minimum wage. But at the same time, that company made sure that no knowledge could be gathered about these practices. So the practices left a mark on people's bodies. You could see their hands destroyed by chemical products. You could see their children starving. Uh, you could see uh, their, uh, their toothless mouths. However, what you could not see would be a single trace uh, of what had happened uh, within um, the text that matter and through which power functions. Yeah, so this is interesting because there has been an interruption of the gathering of knowledge about these people. And that interruption, that epistemological interruption has very important consequences. It puts people into more misery and it allows the company, in that case it was the Coca-Cola company, to create super profits. Yeah, so epistemology matters in terms of how knowledge circulates and in terms of understanding and accepting and understanding and studying the power effects of knowledge and its production and circulation. Finally, and this is my last word about the significance of epistemological relativism in academic debates, because uh, what, what everything I have said means is that there is more than just getting the facts right. Certainly, as ontological realists, we want to get the facts as right as possible. But also, as epistemological relativists, we are aware that facts are artificial construction. I mean, this is how Bascar defines facts. The fact is what we is a construction that is made in reference to a situation. So knowledge is also evaluated according to implicit values. Yeah. So it's not only about getting the facts right, but it's also about uh, evaluating knowledge uh, according to values which are usually left implicit, such as, for example, uh, should, is, is science about predicting, or is it about explaining, or is it about describing, or is it about offering tools for emancipation, or is it about offering tools for domination and control by an elite? And finally, it also means increased respect for our adversaries' thesis, because the point I have with this talk, I have reached the threshold of dialectics, but I have not engaged and I am not starting on dialectics. What I would like to suggest, however, is that what epistemological relativism forces us ultimately to do is to have a dialectical approach to realism. Why? Because it means that whenever you have theory A and theory B, you cannot assume that because you hold theory A, you are right and that theory B is wrong. You cannot even hold that, well, one of them is right, you might be right, and they, or they might be, uh, and they might be right. There is more to this. What we can assume is that ultimately, a more satisfactory theory will probably encompass bits of theory A and bits of theory B, but which are mixed together in a way that we cannot predict from the outcome, from the outset. It is really through the debate is through the academic debate and through the academic discussion that both theory A, which is my cherished theory, and theory B, which is my adversary's theory, will be improved and perhaps ultimately superseded. Yeah, so at this point, I believe that perhaps we can call it a first introduction uh, to epistemological relativism or a refresher on epistemological relativism. And now I have spoken a lot. Is it okay if we take maybe a two minute break and then we could move on to part two uh, and discuss, uh, discussing uh, your research project? How does this sound? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, sounds, that sounds good as well. Okay. Hello, everyone. So I seem to have gathered quite a few questions. Uh, Fidelis, do you want to start? Mm -hmm. um, I think I have the, from the beginning of the presentation, I think uh, you did raise issues concerning morality. Um, in terms of, uh, the, for example, the requirement in uh, gathering data and so on. But at the same time, research um, will guide us or provide the principles to deal with ethical issues. But we cannot conflict uh, or combine morality and ethics because they, if you look at it in more nuanced level, it can be different. So by going through the epistemological relativism, um, I think 
dialectism will help us to deal with the morality and ethics, issues of ethics coming into play. Um, I don't know what your view is in terms of that, because of the differences underlying in morality and ethics when it comes uh, to- to be, an, to be sure, are you talking about the differences between ethics and morality? Yes. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah. How, so how would you, because um, uh, for, so some authors use the expression ethics and morality as strictly synonymous and others yeah. differentiate them. So yes. I understand that you want to differentiate them. Uh, how do you differentiate them? Yes, so if I'm going to differentiate them, when you come to the disposition, which Basket talk, uh, sorry, uh, Lawson talked about. And um, Dr. Let's say, yes, let's say my cultural background enables me to approach the epistemological relativism in a different perspective, mm -hmm. or let's say my interpretivist uh, capability in, yeah. in approaching the, 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 uh, the sources of knowledge or things like that. The principles that I will read concerning ethical may make different concepts differently from my background, uh, uh, which I classify as moral, moral, moral um, issues. So are you yeah. saying that one is more practical? Uh, so ethics is more practical, whereas morality is more cultural in the sense yes. that yeah, morality yeah. corresponds to the uh, to all the ideas we have about what constitutes a good life and good behavior. And ethics is about the practices that get us into a good life and good behavior. So, so, so I mean, sense, may, and, uh, I mean, I'd like to leave room for the other questions, but my immediate re re reaction is that I like your research project. Uh, I think that there, uh, it, it, it is certainly worth uh, pursuing. Um, I, I believe that it is eminently congruent with an epistemologically relativist sense, if anything, because it acknowledges that participants can have uh, different, uh, different viewpoints, but also that what counts as ethical uh, uh, will depend, well, it will depend on, uh, on universal, but also on contextual matters. So the universal matters will be the basic needs, the basic human needs that needs to be fulfilled. But then it can also be contextual matters, uh, such as uh, traditions that make us, for example, want to marry at a certain age, or that make us uh, desire certain things. And so I guess my understanding is that it is eminently congruent with epistemological relativism. Epistemological relativism is perhaps a bit less at the center of your research project um, than uh, also questions of judgmental rationality. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Fidelis. I, I'd like, if if that's okay, to also address some of the other questions that have been asked. So we have Mat Matthias, who say who asks, what allows for dialogue or discussion to happen? One sees the circle, another sees the square. What is the common ground or room in which they can move and talk to each other? This may connect to judgmental rationality. What is the basis for judgmental rationality? What an excellent question, Matthias. I would say the first basis they have, even before judgmental rationality, is ontological realism. If both participants believe that they are looking at different objects or that the objects they're looking at belong to different worlds and that these worlds are entirely incommensurable, then there is absolutely no reason why they should discuss. There is no reason why they should agree on anything. Um, and we are stuck. In order, for them actually, for that discussion to happen in a constructive way, in a way that produces even further knowledge and further good knowledge, then we need that ontologically realist assumption that actually they might be, emphasis on the might, but they might be actually talking about the same object. And then the question becomes, how come this object looks like a square for one and looks like a circle for the other? And then out of reflection, not necessarily discussion, but out of reflection, which involves actually internal dialogue and internal discussion, and then we could come up with the idea that, well, the question then is, what is this object that will look like a square from a certain perspective and a round from another perspective? Hey, where were you standing? Oh, you were standing there while I was standing here. Hey, actually, so there are various objects that could fit in the bill, and one of these objects could be a cylinder. 
And so hypothesis, but actually a hypothesis which is reasoned and grounded and backed up, uh, maybe we've got a cylinder here, there. Or perhaps a differently shaped object that you could imagine uh, other alternatives. You could imagine something other than the cylinder. Uh, however, the cylinder will be one good candidate. Uh, and by doing this, actually, the two parties have got closer to truth. Um, and they got, they, got, they got closer to truth while still remaining fallible. Um, yeah, so this would be my answer to Matthias. Then uh, Hazuki Kajiwara asks us, for example, aren't rights and justice also certain in epistemological relativism? Well, here, if you are interested on these topics, I understand that recently Tony Lawson has been writing a little bit, uh, actually quite a bit, on uh, rights as uh, positions, uh, positional powers. And so Tony, and Tony had a discussion of human rights. And what Tony says is that, at least according to his own realist definition of rights, uh, rights uh, happen and operate within a community. It is within a community that the people hold certain rights. Uh, it is within a community that rights are recognized. Now, is there such a thing as a human community? Perhaps. If there is such a thing as a human community, then we could say that all well, human rights would be rights that both operate for the members of this community, uh, but also which are, are accepted and which are operational by people. Unfortunately, for the moment, it's not yet the case. I mean, the idea of human rights is, for the moment, uh, still a horizon uh, more than a reality. Uh, why so? Well, perhaps, perhaps because the idea of human rights was pretty well connected with the communitarian uh, way of looking at things uh, in revolutionary France, or at least among the revolutionaries in France at the uh, dawn of the 19th century. Um, uh, this was an idea that could be articulated relatively easily, the idea of universal human rights, uh, but in other communities, which still do have rights, uh, the idea of human rights is more problematic. What does this mean about rights and about uh, human needs and about universality? Uh, if, I under if I remember correctly, Tony's conclusion was that, well, actually human needs might be universal. Uh, human rights are not universal, but this is not necessarily a problem. Um, uh, it is not a problem in the sense that what really matters is about addressing human needs and perhaps changing our human communities to such an extent that then they will start to recognize rights for human beings, even outside of the community. But Tony insists um, the, what, the, in order to operate even a very abstract or even a very universalistic uh, conception of human rights, uh, we'll still need to operate within given communities. And so he would probably say that one of the reasons why the idea of human rights had limited impact has been because it did not connect sufficiently with the uh, rules and procedures and practices operating in each given human community. Yeah, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this would be uh, the answer. Uh, for more, more specifics, do have a look at how Tony Lawson has addressed these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a whole thread uh, there. Then Ronald asks us, um, how do you how do you and how do we deal with fake news in terms of epistemological relativism? What makes fake news fake and not just fallible? Ah, well, here we have got two questions. I mean, the answer to the first question is very straightforward. Uh, I could say, well, actually, it's ontological realism and it is epistemological relativism that are our safeguards. Uh, I would even advise you to have a look at Doug Porpora. Actually, maybe I should write the names of authors in the box. So Douglas Porpora, who is currently president of the International Association for Critical Realism and who is a good sociologist and a good researcher on media studies. And recently he wrote a book, a uh, not a book, he wrote a paper, very good paper on fake news and on alternative forms of journalism. Um, what makes fake news fake and not just fallible? Well, 
Well, of course, we can, there is a two-pronged answer. So first, why are they, what makes them fallible or how can we criticize them? On, um, how can we criticize them? Well, the first one can be in terms of their fallibility and they fail, and we can try to show that they fail. And for this, we would rely on ontological realism and, and judgmental rationality. Then your second question is even more interesting because it's about saying, well, but there is, since there is more than fallibility, then there is epistemological relativism prompt us to say a bit more than saying this news is fake. And I agree with you, there is more we can say. We can also say this news is fake and this is how it has been produced look at the production of news news many news especially fake news are produced in fake news factories how do these work well cambridge analytica gives us one case in point uh, which interests do they serve who are the people who are paying for these news yeah so behind actually epistemological relativism prompts us to look at the whole sociological circuits that exist behind the news uh, for this news to be produced, it had conditions of possibility. I would say, go and have a look at the conditions of production of fake news. Who pays whom? For what? What do they ask them to do? Uh, there are more and more testimonies of journalists who say that they receive very nice, very interesting offers, uh, typically from Russian sources or others. And that would give them a very detailed script on what they should be doing. Yeah, and this detailed script and the monies they receive are all part of the factory of the fake news. And they're all part of understanding the fake news, not only in terms of the message it sends, but also on the political effect it intends, how it tries to make us act differently. So very, very good question, Ronald. And yes, I believe that uh, a richer understanding of epistemological relativism should open the door to a richer study of fake news. Uh, Doug Porpora is your man for this. Then Paul Junker, Junker uh, Hoffren. So my apologies if I mispronounce any names. So he says, uh, I am sorry, I have to leave, but a question. So if this interview is recorded, I hope you can hear my answer. The question is, I very much like your comments about taking into account the practices of, for instance, employees as they would know more than the researcher, yes. Currently, I am in a project where we will study work processes in deconstruction, particular salvaging concrete elements. We aim exactly to incorporate practice, but this is based on theories of work by Christophe Dejour and Axel Honneth. So I know a bit of Axel Honneth. How do you think this would, could be done best as we as researchers do not know the work and the employees have to invent new methods also, huh? So you don't know the work, the employees have got some form of knowledge, which is probably very tacit, and they are inventing uh, their own methods. So they can't yet describe them orally, I guess, or not with the clarity they will have in a few years' time. This is kind of studying knowledge production at the practical knowledge level. Well, yes, you are studying knowledge production, but look at what is being produced. I mean, there are many things that are being produced here in this case. Um, there is knowledge, uh, there is profit, uh, there is prestige, there is identity. Uh, there are uh, there is their whole little world uh, which is uh, being uh, being produced. Um, I would say, well, actually, epistemological relativism opens the door for studying from a realist perspective the political effects of knowledge. Mm, so basically, at the very least, there is absolutely nothing wrong in asking these questions. Um, now, I guess I would be hard pressed to give more specific advice because uh, obviously your description is, uh, is, is very short. I would encourage you to, you really, to use also to give some space, to leave space to materiality. Yeah, so here you're studying the production of knowledge, but also what are the other products? Uh, these could, could be concrete elements. Uh, uh, which are being recycled or produced or reproduced and rearranged. Uh, and uh, being attentive to the links uh, between uh, knowledge and power could be helpful. Being attentive to the links between uh, culture and materiality uh, could also be uh, helpful in this, uh, in this project. Then Rina, Rina King asked us, I assume one would engage dialectically within your research with opposing theories and resolve it closer to the truth. Well, this is what we try. Sometimes it doesn't work, but yeah, that's what we try to do. Are you referring to engagement after one has completed and published the body of knowledge? 
Yes, I'm referring to that uh, and to more. I would say that engagement, it starts really from the start. I mean, first there is this constant, constant engagement that we have with ourselves. And this engagement that we have with ourselves is also nourished and inspired by the people with whom we have discussed in the past as researchers and as lay persons. Um, but then also you start your project and you talk about it either with colleagues or you talk about it with your supervisor. This is also covered by what I talk about when I talk about uh, evaluating knowledge and uh, discussing it. Uh, then uh, you start doing your research and then before you start writing the paper or as you write the first draft and you present it at conferences. Uh, and it is key. It is actually, if you think about it, look at what happens when you present a paper at conferences and what happens when you don't present a paper at conferences. When you don't present a paper at conferences, your paper gets rejected. That simple. Well, sometimes after a lot of, you know, experience, after 15 or 20 years, then you become a more seasoned academic and you get a better chance at getting at getting the feel uh, of the field. Uh, but yet, uh, it is, I think that there is a lot to learn epistemologically from the failure of papers that have not been presented at conferences. What this means is that the discussion with an external audience has started really before the submission, before the formal submission to a journal. And then you submit it to the journal, the editor reads it, and if the editor likes it, or if they feel there is potential in it, they send it to reviewers. And these reviewers as well are also part of all the conversations that shape a paper. Yeah, so as we can see, research is eminent, an eminently collective endeavor. And I would include all these rounds and all these conversations in this dialectical process, uh, not only what happens uh, once uh, the book is printed. Uh, so thank you, Rina. That was really a very inspiring uh, question. Um, and then, uh, Rina so has put, then I can see that, oh, so Dave also ha asked me, had asked me a question, I think it was in a direct message. I'm sorry, I'm not re oh, oh, I'm still not as proficient as I should be with Zoom. Um, but, um, 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 um. So here, Dave says, oh, it's a very good question. Dave asks, is it only possible to be judgmentally rational on the basis of dialogue? Or can we come to judgmentally rational conclusions on our own? Well, here I would like to disappoint Dave a bit and say yes to both. Um, yes to both, as long as we remember that dialogue can be internal, as long as we remember that there can be internal conversations. So Dave is absolutely right to say that us as individual subjects, we do part and actually much of the work of science. Um, and we do this reflexively. We do this out of entering in a dialogue with ourselves. There are various ways of looking at this. One is about a discussion, a conversation between the I and me. Uh, another approach to this is about a conversation with uh, generalized others. Um, I think well, what both approaches have to tell us is that yes, dialogue or at least the confrontation of ideas is key into how knowledge is produced and how it advances. This confrontation of ideas can happen internally when I reflect about what I'm doing and it can happen also externally when I'm discussing say with my old PhD supervisor or with my PhD students now. Uh, what we should remember, however, is that even when it happens internally, the words I use have not been entirely created by myself. The language I use, the research strategies I use, uh, and critical realism, and before critical realism, uh, the whole Aristotelian tradition and the whole pragmatist uh, tradition, uh, which have given birth to critical realism, existed before uh, me, and they hopefully they will continue to exist albeit under a different format for me. What does this mean? It means that precisely science is a collective process, although we should never ever diminish the fundamental importance of the individual researcher, the fundamental importance of the creative act that can only happen in the mind of a person, of an individual person. Uh, so this would be my response to today's excellent question. And then another one from Dave. What about feminist standpoint theory? Can women have a privileged epistemic standpoint? 
Here I'm tempted to answer yes. I mean, if anything, when we look at the history of how women uh, started doing ethnography, um, uh, initially, if I remember correctly, it was one of the, it was a male ethnographer and who had an assistant. So he was an anthropologist and he asked his assistant also to get, to gather observations. And uh, one of the assistants happened to be a woman and he was open-minded enough to entrust her with that task at a time when it was expected that women were of feeble uh, capa cap capacities. And of course, the big discovery was that this female assistant came up with observations that were really very different, that were really very different from the observations made by male assistants and by the researcher himself. And the researcher was sufficiently open-minded to acknowledge this as a strength and not as a weakness. Yes, instead of saying, well, she's biased, let's uh, ignore what she has said. He said, wow, uh, actually there is a whole entire new standpoint which has opened to us. So yes, I believe that women bring us, observe different things. Why so? Is it for biological reasons? Well, I, don't, I, can't, I can't find any compelling arguments for this. Perhaps one could argue that, well, uh, female brains are distributed slightly differently, but as far as I can tell, I haven't found any compelling arguments. Another theory, again, it's not either or, it could well be and and, is that when you are born in contemporary society and positioned as a woman, uh, then you are taught to look at different things than when you're positioned as a little boy. And indeed, um, when uh, women do uh, observa uh, sociological observation, they tend to be more sensitive than men. Again, this is a big generalization, but they can be more sensitive than men to, of course, oppressions that women uh, will incur, uh, but also the lived realities of tasks which are uh, still mainly uh, he heavily attributed to, to women. Uh, also, they tend to be quite attentive to relationality and to relation. Uh, some psychologists have even theorized this up to the games that children play, arguing that little girls are encouraged uh, to play very collaborative activities, whereas little boys are encouraged to play more competitively. Perhaps, I mean, these are all elements uh, of explanation. However, the facts uh, about which I am pretty sure is that today uh, women tend to see slightly different things than men and that, this is, uh, and that this is a richness and that in order to understand situations of domination, we also need to have the speech of the subaltern and we also need to have the, uh, the perspective of both actors involved, but especially the subalterns uh, who, who usually ha offer much richer descriptions of domination uh, than those in more privileged positions. Are there any other, so now it's 10.24, we've still got maybe six minutes. Are there people who might want to ask a question orally? Ismail, there are three more on the Q&A, which have just appeared in the last minute. Okay, um, just having a look at the Q&A. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, 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 got it again. So may I have the Lawson's article name, please? Uh, yes, of course. So that was, in what context was I talking about this article about Tony Lawson? Um, rights and justice. Sorry? The rights and justice discussion. Rights and justice? Yeah. Yeah, human rights and... Uh, oh, yeah, 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 right. Um, let's see if I can find it right now. I mean, I, I don't have, I haven't memorized the reference. If you go on Google and if you type Lawson, right, human, and then Tony, so Tony Lawson, human, right. Mm. Have a look at his book, uh, The Nature of Social Reality. It's, it's a very good book. And he might, he might have addressed this question there, even in passing. And then you should be able to uh, trail the references and to trace the reference trail. So I would, so I would look at uh, his nature of social reality. I'm gonna put the, I'm gonna put the, the link in the chat box.
here you go. So the nature of social reality issues in social ontology. You can purchase it. You can download the bootleg version of it. It's really your own take. Um, then I can see that uh, Rina Raina King, uh, referring to the discussion on women, isn't the same as saying that white people do not have a real voice in Black Lives Matter. Um, if I may, I would like to reformulate. I mean, if I had to address this question, I would perhaps want to reformulate by talking about a different voice rather than saying not have a real voice. I would say that in order to address the question of racial injustice or gender injustice, I really am a firm believer that we should avoid demonizing either party, uh, that the solution consists in trying to understand the standpoints of each of the parties, even if this means in the process of gently criticizing this standpoint, even if it means in the process of raising our awareness that, um, well, the initially held standpoint um, was uh, incomplete, biased, and ultimately violent. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, before, before we can reach that conclusion, my own approach would consist in also giving voice to the white women, to the white men, uh, as well as to the black men and to the white police officers, as well as to the black police officers. And I believe that an account that would give, that would listen to these voices uh, will probably offer a richer, uh, will offer the basis for a richer theorization of what is going on, uh, of the violence, uh, of the oppression, of the exploitation, and also of the misunderstandings and of the fears uh, justified or usually otherwise. Yeah, so I would say, I wouldn't say they do not have a real voice. I would say they have a different voice that comes from a different perspective. And this is also the difficulty. I mean, for a, a, a white person wanting to help a social movement, uh, say a, a minority social movement, they need to be very careful about the stance they take. Uh, it is not the white person's duty to liberate uh, uh, other members. However, they can be sympathetic, they can stand as allies, uh, they can acknowledge that uh, the way they view the world is different uh, in many respects, and that these differences can also be understood through rational discussion. Yeah, so what judgmental rationality tells us is that it is possible to have a rational discussion about these differences. Uh, then Bata Pasquier, Pasquier, uh, sorry, I mispronounced your name, Bata. Does critical realism offer a stratified ontological framework to account for conditions of possibility for phenomenological occurrences? I would say, yes, this is what critical realism is all about. Uh, we've got phenomena, you see squares, you see rounds, and however, we're interested in the cylinder uh, that is behind. Uh, even though we might only be able to see in two dimensions, uh, we can accept, uh, uh, and we have good grounds to believe that uh, the world is composed of three-dimensional objects, or perhaps even objects in more than three dimensions. And then I can see, so Dave also has put, oh yeah, oh, now I understand what's going on. When I typed Tony Lawson's reference, I sent it to Dave as a direct message, foolish me. Um, and then, Dave, who adds, perhaps the point about Black Lives Matter is that Black voices have often been ignored, absolutely, and now need to be heard in addition to those we can already hear. Yes, I agree. And I would add, I would expect from a fruitful conversation, both changes, both in the Black voices and in the white voices. Um, but this can only happen from, through, after, uh discussions and dialogues that are going to be complex that uh, that have started already that are complex uh, that happens uh, at all levels of society even when a group of friends uh, discusses in the pub oh what do you think about the black lives matter uh thing then they are doing something extremely important they're doing something very important because they're opening up to the variety of perspectives and to uh, the invisible oppressions uh, that uh, people who are not immediate, who are not exactly like them, still suffer, and that they, as 
say, white persons can nonetheless appreciate. They might not feel it in the flesh in the same way, but they can be humble about the fact that they don't feel it in the flesh in the same way because they haven't been subjected to continuous racism. But they can still, out of humility and out of sociological imagination, start imagining how awful it must be. And actually, they can also, out of humility and social, uh, sociological imagination, uh, open up to listening to the accounts of those people who have been on the direct receiving end uh, of violence. Yes, I would say it's a matter of adding their voices, but it's also a matter of opening up to changing our own voice after having listened to theirs. And it's also a matter of accepting that also their own voice will perhaps change once we are changing uh, our own voices and so on and so forth. Yeah, so it's really, I, I see it as ultimately a dialectical process, which is based on uh, epistemological relativism in the sense of accepting that the others have a different perspective uh, that we might not entirely be able to expose, but to which we can open up out of sociological imagination and uh, epistemological humility. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Yes, well, that's wonderful. I see we've got to, to 9.30, which is uh, uh, what, we, what we promised people, and, and I see that we've run out of questions, so that's the uh, perfect timing. Um, is wow. there anything else you want to say before we wind up, Ismail? Not really. Um, thank you, Dave, also for, you, you told me that you had posted, I, I wrote a few years ago, I wrote a small piece on relativism. So I was thinking that perhaps after hearing uh, my talk today, uh, maybe some of you might be interested in reading it. It's only 2000 words long. So I was thinking, well, it's short, perhaps it can be useful. And I believe that Dave has posted it uh, or will post it soon on the Realist Network. Yes, indeed. That, so that's on the workshops page on the uh, criticalrealismnetwork.org site um, under the, the entry for this week. And, and, and later on, we will, put um, a video of one of these sessions on there too. And, and if you can send them to me, Ismail will put Ismail's slides on there too. Um, oh yes, I should definitely send you the yeah. slides, Dave. Yeah, Excellent. yeah, yeah. We'll do this first thing after the, today's Excellent. meeting. Excellent. Um, and I, I, there's, there's also a forum on there where you can continue uh, conversations about these questions if, if you'd like to do that. I must say I'm feeling delighted. I'm seeing so many kind comments on the forum. Uh, particular thoughts to Hazuki Kajiwara, who says that uh, critical realists are a little bit isolated in Tokyo. Uh, Dave, uh, since you are so involved with the realist network, I would be hard pressed to say whom, but I was under the impression that we did have uh, nodes, uh, critical realist uh, nodes uh, in Japan. There's, there's, yeah. I guess there's two things. One is that I, I know there are one or two Japanese people involved in the Cambridge Social Ontology Group. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, but the other thing, well, actually, three things. <laughs> the second thing is that that we have a, a, a map on the Critical Realism Network dot org website with um, pins, with, which help people to contact others in their area. We don't have a pin for for Japan, but but uh, if you know, the, our Japanese participants would like to email me. We could we could put them on there, and 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 other people in Japan could contact them. But we do have a pin for um, the Critical Realism Network Asia Pacific, which yeah. um, one of the key figures there is Johnny Go, who's um, oh, cylinder, yes, I know. Who's cylinder picture. Yeah, thank you. Who cylinder picture is now used earlier? Yeah. So um, they have a website. So if you if you look at the map, it's, I think the page is called Community. Maybe it's called Map on on the Critical Realism Network dot org website then you'll find um, a pin for the asia pacific network and you can follow that through to their site and and contact people that way and also there is i mean i think that what you're saying Davis, can be super useful for hazuki kajiwara and and all the others in this group who are who are feeling a little bit isolated but also i would like to add also don't hesitate to create your own reading group um this is uh, this is what many PhD students and what many early career researchers do, and it's a very powerful way of, uh, basically, you just create a reading group, say, on the possibility of naturalism, or perhaps more recently on one of Dave's books, or one of Margaret Archer's books, 
And you, all you need are two friends and a bottle of any drink you like. It can be tea or it can be wine or orange juice, yeah? And, and a promise that you will read uh, 30 or 50 pages of the book uh, each uh, before you meet. And then you just meet and it's extremely enjoyable and pleasurable. And this is how, this is how actually you create uh, a group of people uh, who have read the same things as you did and with whom you can continue to talk at the local level. Um, so I would like really to encourage everyone hearing me to uh, create reading groups. Uh, it can be around critical realism, of course, but it can be also about something else. It can be more generally on social theory or more generally on social ontology, uh, but do not underestimate your own agential powers. Excellent. Okay, well, I think, I think probably this is time for us to wind up and let me add my thanks to everyone's el everyone else's. That was a fascinating talk, Ismail, and uh, uh, really interesting and enjoyable to be part of.